seven, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the John DeVito Show. It is Wednesday, March 10th. And today, I wasn't going to do a show, but I was working this morning, working hard at my computer. In the background, I had a sports movie on. And it's a sports movie that I generally don't think of as being a great sports movie. But I watched it this morning while I was working. And man, I don't think I realized how good this movie was. So it it gave me an idea. I want to get on today and talk about the most underrated sports movies that we may all be missing. So... I'll get going in about a minute, sit back and chill, and we'll get going And once my intro song is over. So welcome to the John DeVito Show. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the John DeVito Show. It, it is uh, March 10th. It's 11.20 a.m., and uh, it's you know right now only 45 degrees here in Massachusetts, but we're going to be warming up into the mid-50s today, and then tomorrow we're going to be hitting 60, maybe higher, into the 60s. Now, I know for some of you that live in warm climates, places like Florida, Texas, Alabama, wherever you may be, sunny California, those temperatures may not mean a lot to you. But for people here up in the Northeast, 60 degrees is like a godsend at this time of year. Because as you know, we talk about it quite a bit. We're kind of trapped inside for several months. You know, we get the cold weather, we get the darkness, and it's sometimes very difficult to deal with. So this weekend also gives us more reason to be excited because we are turning the clocks forward this week. So we've got more daylight. It's 60 degrees. You know, it's going to be dark, maybe closer to 8 o'clock now at night. And things are finally turning for the better. So we're kind of excited about all that. So the the good weather's coming. You know, spring's on the horizon. We've got the birds are coming back to the area. Flowers are going to be coming back soon. You know, we're going to start having more outdoor time, which is great. And, uh, of course, one of my favorite things on the planet is going to be starting very soon and that would be baseball. So I am very excited about baseball season. Uh, Most of you know I'm a big Boston Red Sox fan, and uh, I'm looking forward to the Sox. I mean, again, it may not be a great season this year for the Boston Red Sox. They're kind of rebuilding this year, and uh, we'll kind of see, you know, what direction that goes in this year. But uh, we are excited here in Massachusetts, especially where I live, directly in the center of the state. Uh, The AAA affiliate affiliate for the Red Sox is actually moving to Worcester, Massachusetts. So the Pawtucket Red Sox are actually moving to Worcester, and they're going to be about 20 minutes away from my house. They built a new stadium, and we're hoping the COVID regulations are kind of released enough where we can get in and hopefully enjoy uh, some baseball right here in Worcester. But also, even if uh, that doesn't happen, you know, my boys are going to be playing travel baseball very soon. They play for an organization in Worcester, Massachusetts, and we're going to have a bunch of baseball games to watch very, very soon. What's up, Mr. Ray? What's up, Eric? What's up, everybody coming into the chat? And it was funny. I was not going to do a show today, as I said in my introduction a little bit earlier. And this morning I was working, and in the background I always have the TV on. So I was watching uh, a sports movie, and I happened to be watching uh, the 1999 movie For the Love of the Game with Kevin Costner. Great baseball movie, and it's not a movie that ever really even comes to mind for me when I'm thinking about great sports movies because I'm a huge sports fan. You know, I love basketball. Well, I used to love basketball, not as much anymore, but uh, I love baseball, love football. You know, hockey, I could live with or without it, but I do try to, you know, enjoy hockey movies when they come out and they're inspirational. But I was watching this morning for the love of the game, Kevin Costner movie. And when you think about, you know, Kevin Costner and you think of baseball, you know, for me, I think of movies like Field of Dreams. I think about, uh, you know, Bull Durham and movies like that that are kind of well-known baseball movies that he's been in. But, you know, I've seen now, for the love of the game, probably, I don't know, two or three times. And I'd say the first time I saw it, I did not like the movie. I don't, I don't know why I didn't like it. I don't know if it wasn't what I expected. Maybe I was kind of, you know, Kevin Costnered out on baseball movies because I'd already seen 
you know, Field of Dreams, which is one of my favorite all-time baseball movies, just a great, great movie about a relationship with his dad and, you know, missing his dream of playing baseball and, you know, building the uh, the baseball field in the middle of the cornfield and having the whole shoeless Joe Jackson aspect to the movie. Just a great, great, great movie. Uh, Bull Durham also is one of those movies that initially, and I wouldn't say this is an underrated movie. Bull Durham is a well-known baseball movie. And uh, I didn't love it at first. And that was one of those movies I had to watch maybe like, you know, three or four times before I really learned to appreciate that movie. But this morning, as I watched for the, for the love of the game, I'm like, damn, this is a good, solid baseball movie. I don't know if anyone's seen the movie. I don't want to give away too much. And I've got like 26 movies on my list. And seeing this movie this morning kind of gave me the idea to do this podcast today because I'm kind of sick of talking about politics and I love sports and I want to talk about some other things every now and then. But, uh, man, it was a good movie where you've got this 40-year-old pitcher who's on the mound and he's in the middle of throwing a perfect game. It's at the end of his career. You know, he was a 19-year major league veteran and he's thinking about retirement. You know, what's he going to do next? He's got a girlfriend who was uh, Kelly Preston, you know, John Travolta's wife, who unfortunately I believe passed away not too long ago. But uh, he was, you know, reflecting back on his life, thinking about his childhood, thinking about his relationship with her. And then they kept flashing back into the game as he's, you know, kind of progressing through this game and actually pitching a no uh, perfect game in the major leagues. So just, uh, you know, I watched the whole thing and just sat there. I literally at certain points had like tears in my eyes and just a great, great movie. So I wasn't going to do a podcast and that kind of gave me the decision today. I started thinking about other underrated sports movies that, you know, maybe are not completely, completely on everybody's radar. And if you guys have any in the chat, bring them in, you know, let me know some sports movies that maybe are kind of, you know, off, um, you know, off the, uh, off the radar. That's something that you might like. And uh, let's see, with 26 movies, you can't stick to one for 12 minutes. Yes, I can. This is going to be a three-minute, a three-hour podcast, dude. Come on. All right, Rookie of the Year. That was a good one, too, I see, Eric. All right, so not all of them are going to be as long as this. And you know, I do always take Roastmaster's Glenn opinion very seriously because he's a professional, and I don't want to talk too long about one movie. So for the love of the game is why I started this list. And let's start from the top. These are not in any particular order, okay? So this isn't ranked like 26 to 1 or 1 to 26 or anything to that effect. All right. So going back, this is actually a movie that I watched in high school back in the day because I'm an old son of a bitch, as you all know. And uh, I really like the football movie. I'm sure some of you have probably seen it. Tom Cruise, All the Right Moves from 1983. I don't know who's seen who's seen that movie, but he's you know it's a young high school kid growing up in the Perts Pittsburgh area. His family's in the steel business, and he plays for Craig T. Nelson is the head football coach. And Craig T. Nelson is you know your typical high fo- high school football coach, kind of a pain in the ass, you know, disciplinarian. And uh, Tom Cruise gets into some trouble throughout high school. Uh, you know, during the football season in his senior year, he wants to you know get out of this small town and play in college. So he does a few things he shouldn't do, and Craig T. Nelson basically kind of bans him from all the colleges, tells everybody he has a bad attitude and all that stuff. So, you know, it's just a great, great football movie. Reminds me of playing football back in high school. So I don't know if anyone out there has seen that, but All the Right Moves, great, great movie. If you haven't seen it from 1983, I would definitely recommend that. I'm looking up in the chat. I see Dennis Quaid, right? No kidding, huh? That that movie, yeah, I didn't love that movie, but not a bad movie. Cool Runnings, that was a good one, Eric. I remember that. I did. That's not on my list, but I do like that. Uh, Little Giants, that was also funny. Now, next on my list, you've got all the right moves. And, of course, you already know for the love of the game with Kevin Costner is on my list. Fever Pitch. Now, again, this, I might be skewed a little bit here. You know, is it a great baseball movie? Probably not. But I'm a Red Sox fan, and it was Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore in Boston. It was at Fenway Park. And this turned out to be the year where the Red Sox finally broke the 86-year-old curse of the Bambino and it, it was listed as uh, released in 2005, but the movie was filmed during the Red Sox run in 2004. And one of the things I thought was kind of funny about fever pitch was that they actually had to reshoot the ending because they had, they had finished the movie and then the Red Sox won the world series and they completely had to kind of reshoot the, reshoot the whole thing, which I thought was funny. So for the love of the game, all the right moves from 1983 fever pitch from 2005, you know, I, I don't know if I'd love Jimmy Fallon in that role, but Drew Barrymore was good. And it was really a funny movie. And it kind of displayed kind of like the hate between Red Sox and Yankee fans. I mean, unless you live in an area that's got like a huge sports rivalry, you don't understand, you know, Red Sox, Yankees. I mean, maybe if you're a football fan, 
and you're looking at, uh, you know, Michigan, Ohio state or something to that effect, you can understand, Oh, old man. That's a good one. I did not have that on my list. And that is a good one. The natural with Robert Redford, you know, initially that was one of those movies where I did not like the movie and it, uh, really kind of grabbed my attention after I saw it for a couple of times. And, uh, yeah, the natural with Robert Redford, that is definitely a good one that did not make my list and should be on the list as one of the most underrated movies of all time. Now, this is one, I don't know if all of you saw this one, but this was a really good movie. And I think it was only on HBO. If I remember correctly, you might have to look for this on HBO or Netflix, but if you didn't see the movie 61, that's a movie about, uh, you know, the, the season of 1961, where Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle were both chasing Babe Ruth's, you know, single season record of 60 home runs in that particular year. And it wasn't just about baseball. It was about the struggles that Mickey Mantle had that Roger Maris had during that year. You know, Roger Maris was a guy that was brought in from another organization. He was dealing with a lot of anxiety. The fans of New York kind of hated him. They did not want him to beat Babe Ruth's record. Just a very, very good, good film. And, you know, really, I really enjoyed that. And you you saw also that, you know, Mickey Mantle was right in the, the race with uh, Roger Maris. And uh, he ended up kind of, uh, you know, tailing off at the end of the season because he had some serious injuries that he was trying to play through. But to see, an, you know, an inside look about the anxiety that Roger Maris had in that particular year, there was, there was one scene in particular where they were looking to interview Roger Maris. Like the press was in, they were hounding him, and he was in the shower he wouldn't come out and his hair was literally falling out. Like he was grabbing his hair and pulling his hair out of his head because he was so anxious about the treatment that uh, he was getting from the New York media. So, and again, so, some of these, you know, not all of these you may look at as being underrated. These are movies that I, you know, maybe don't consider those top tier sports movies, but I've seen them and I love them. A league of their own is on my list, Eric, and I'm going to get to that. I, you'll be hard pressed to find a baseball movie that I don't love. And uh, I did recently watch that also. And I'll get to that in a second. So um, another one on my list. And again, you know, I don't know if this is underrated, but I don't know if everyone has seen this movie, but the uh, 2011 movie Moneyball with uh, Brad Pitt. I thought that was an excellent movie. It was the story of Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's who did not have a budget and came up with the, the new kind of algorithm to figure out how they could actually get in certain players for the minimal minimal amount of money and still put together like a really solid team based on like on base percentage and things like that. And uh, it was funny because the Red Sox actually did try to rec rec recruit away Billy Bean and get him to the Red Sox at one point. And he refused the deal and they offered him a ton of money. So Moneyball, I thought was a great movie, really enjoyed it. And definitely if you haven't seen it, that's one that you should definitely check out. So just to run down the ones I've said so far, we've got uh, For the Love of the Game, 1999 with Kevin Costner. He's well known for Field of Dreams and Bull Durham, but For the Love of the Game was a very, very good baseball movie. I watched it again this morning and just loved it. All the Right Moves, uh, Tom Cruise football movie from 1983, uh, Fever Pitch, uh, Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore from 2005, and then, of course, the movie 61 about the home run battle between Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle in the year 1961 when they were chasing down the babe and then uh, Moneyball was the last one I mentioned. So I've got a bunch more on the list and keep them coming in. Uh, I know I, 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 it should be great sports movies, but still a lot of these, I think are underrated movies that don't get the press that some of the other movies get. So now this is one I think that you could see as being definitely underrated. Now, has anyone seen the movie Sea Biscuit? Now, again, I'm not really a horse racing fan, but this movie came out in 2003 and I remember I very reluctantly went and saw this movie. I really had no interest in horse racing, you know, didn't really see, you know, this movie. But, I mean, I, I went to see it, and, man, I walked out of, the, out of the theater like, Jesus, that was an inspirational, just phenomenal movie about just an undersized horse that was all heart and went out and won, you know, all these different races that they did not expect uh, the horse to compete in. And uh, Seabiscuit, if you have not seen that movie, Rent it. You won't be sorry. It was really a great movie. I loved it. All right. Um, going into 1996. Now, again, going back to Kevin Costner again. Kevin Costner is kind of one of those go-to go, go -to guys when it comes to sports. And I, I think I have this listed on my underrated uh, list because initially I didn't like this movie at all. The first time or two I saw it, I thought it was a stupid movie. I didn't like it. I just didn't. It did not connect with me. But since then, I've probably watched it another three or four times. And I've got to say that the movie has really kind of grabbed my attention. 
So Tin Cup, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that. Good golf movie, and uh, Cheech from Cheech and Chong was his caddy in that movie. So you had, uh, you know, Kevin Costner was kind of a defeated a golf pro working at a driving range and uh, was a, you know, a phenom golfer, and he finally got his chance to play in a big tournament. But his head always got in the way, and just a good movie. You know, it was kind of funny. You got to have a sense of humor going into that. And like I said, initially, I didn't like that movie. But uh, as I have seen it now a couple of times, that one's kind of grown on me and is definitely kind of an underrated comedy movie. But it also it speaks to a lot of the people in sports. Oh, he was. Wasn't he? Don Johnson was such an asshole in that movie. He totally was. Caddy, you know, Caddyshack, great movie. I don't have that on my underrated list. I think that Caddyshack is a movie that speaks for itself. It's out there. Everybody's seen it. Uh, maybe for some people that would be underrated. But, I mean, that is just a legendary movie for me. You know, with Rodney Dangerfield, I mean, the whole cast, Ted Knight, the cast of people they had in that movie, you know, <laughs> I think about Lacey Underall is the name of the young girl in that. I mean, Caddyshack is just a classic. So, you know, for whatever else, whatever else you guys have, you know, bring in the movies that you like. I'd like to read what you're saying. I'm going to continue to get on my list of some of the sports movies that I've loved, that I've considered to be maybe a little bit underrated. So I mentioned Tin Cup, and now Eric brought this one up a little bit earlier. And this is really a legitimately good movie, uh, A League of Their Own from 1992. And this was a true, based on a true story. If you go to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, there's a whole section of that baseball, uh, you know, the baseball museum dedicated to women's baseball. And it was, you know, in the years when the men went away to war, they really didn't have a lot of, of the ball players around. So they de developed a league of women baseball, and they were good baseball players. It was a competitive game. And it was kind of funny when you go back and watch that movie. Uh, you see the girls playing in skirts and things like that. So that had to be a little uncomfortable. But you had a good cast of people. I mean, Gina Davis was in that movie. And then uh, she had her younger sister was the pitcher on that team. And Madonna was in that movie. And, you know, Rosie O'Donnell, who I don't particularly like. But uh, Tom Hanks was actually the manager. And I'm sure you've all heard the line if you haven't seen the movie. You know, there's no crying in baseball. I mean, that's an iconic baseball line that came from um, – you know, Tom Hanks in that movie. So just a, a great movie. And if you love baseball, give it a look. It's definitely worth it. Now, uh, another one, uh, yeah, Happy Gilmore. You know, Happy Gilmore is another one I consider to be more of an iconic movie. And for me, that might be because I'm a big Adam Sandler fan. So Adam Sandler is from New Hampshire, uh, from my home state. And, you know, he's very big in New England. So I've seen that movie a million times. I thought that was hilarious from the first time I saw it. And you're right. The Bob Barker fight in that was hysterical when you went at it with Bob Barker. So for those of you that don't know Bob Barker, some of the younger people on the show, he was the Price is Right uh, host before Drew Carey and uh, did it for something like 40 years. So he's a pretty well-known guy. So uh, I would say definitely that, uh, that you know those movies are all on my list. Now, th this was a tough one. I don't know if anybody saw this, but this was a really – hard movie to watch the 2006 movie we are marshall has everyone seen that if you haven't you know let me know yes or no man this was a tough movie this was about you know the college uh, marshall football program and uh, you know they had a good program strong program and they were flying after a game and they literally showed the, the plane get struck by lightning and the entire plane crashed and the entire marshall football team college football team died in a plane crash along with most of the coaches. I think there was like one coach and maybe one or two players that survived the plane crash. And the, the movie was about, number one, the plane crash, and then what happened to the whole area around it, You know, all the local businesses, the parents that lost kids that played on this Marshall football team, and then the attempt of bringing this Marshall football team back because there were several years where they didn't have a football team because the whole team was killed and – you know, they, they didn't have, I guess, the the thought that maybe they should bring the team back after such a tragedy. But you get to see the whole fight of them trying to get this football team back up and running. And, uh, you know, the, the recruiting and actually them building a football team that wasn't very good, but they actually got it back and got it up and running. And, of course, Marshall has a very proud tradition of football to this day. Now, I, I remember the one scene that I thought was amazing, that Marshall, the coaches, after they, they built the football team, and they, they weren't very good. They were looking to get film of different teams, and they didn't have anything. So they went to one of the competing colleges, and Bobby Bowden was the coach of the competing college. And they walked right in, and they basically just asked point blank, hey, do you think you guys could help us with some film? You know, we're looking to watch film. We're playing you guys in a couple of weeks. 
you know, we're with Marshall. And the, the head coach kind of looked and laughed at them a little bit and uh, said, boy, you guys have a lot of balls. But then he literally invited them in, gave them access to the entire film room and everything they said. And he literally had a cup on his desk for Marshall and was saying how much he supported what they were doing and said, you guys spend as much time as you need here watching film. You can watch film about my teams, whatever you need. It was just a really, really, really good movie. So if you haven't seen it, go out and check it out. I see Eric Kirk, Rudy, of course, absolute classic. Coach Carter, you know, that did not make my list, but that was a good movie. Wildcats, that's another one that I did enjoy as well. Uh, let's see, Roastmaster Glenn. He's an old white guy from New Hampshire. And no way he can pull off Samuel Jackson. Are you talking about me? <laughs> You're right. There's no way, man. Samuel Jackson's a beast, one of my favorite actors. But, yeah, I can't do a Samuel Jackson, man. But I am bald. I'm bald and white. You know, he's bald and African-American. So I guess we at least have the bald thing going together. But I think he's probably a little bit better actor than I am. So I, I'm not going to even try to attempt doing anything that Samuel Jackson does. One of my favorite actors, of course, going back even to like Pulp Fiction. So let's get back to the list. So I talked about We Are Marshall. I already talked about For the Love of the Game. That was buried in the middle of my list. How about the football movie from 1993? Who has seen the program? The program with James Conn, a college football movie. And it was just a very good movie about the whole recruiting process for college football and what it's like to play in college. Christy Swanson was in this movie. Oh, my God. If you haven't seen the program, there's, there's one scene that I think of that's really funny where they show one of the defensive ends, this guy Latimer, who is trying to become a starter on the team. He was a defensive end, just huge, jacked guy, and there were some rumors going on that he was on steroids. So they, the coaches are in their office, and they're looking through the glass window at Latimer lifting in the weight room, and he's got, like, face paint on. He's got, like, 500 pounds on the bar. He takes it. He throws the... You know, throws the bar on the ground, starts yelling and screaming after he had, you know, he had uh, pumped up that weight. And oh my God, it was funny. I remember one of the coaches looks at the head coach and goes, "You know, there's some talk going around that Latimer may be taking steroids." And the coach looks at him and goes, "We're not doctors." <laughs> he just walks away from him. But it was, it was such a good movie about everything that goes on in college football. You know, I'm a guy that played in college. And if you guys don't think steroids is rampant in college football, it completely is. So, uh, good movie. Uh, Blue Chips. I did not have that on my list. I'm, list. I'm glad you mentioned that. That is a great movie, a great basketball movie. Uh, Nick Nolte, you got Shaq makes an appearance in that. And that's all about, you know, that's almost like a basketball version of the program. That is a really good call. Uh, I love that movie. And uh, Bob Cousy made an appearance in that. So it's almost like, you know, the college basketball scene where if you're not giving money to players, then your team is shit and you have to almost pay money to get the good players so you can keep your job. And that was kind of the internal battle in that movie. But there were a lot of good basketball scenes in that movie. And, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because Blue Chips would have definitely been on my list if, uh, you know, if I hadn't forgotten. So thank you for bringing that up. The Sandlot, that is not on my list because I love The Sandlot. That is one of my favorite movies. I actually have a T-shirt with You're Killing Me Smalls with the kid on the shirt that I wear all the time around town. So, again, I'm a huge Sandlot fan. And to me, you know, that that type of movie is almost even a little bit before my time. That was kind of how my father grew up in life, you know, playing on the Sandlots every day. And he did the same thing for football. So for me to watch the Sandlot, it makes me realize, you know, how things were kind of like in the 50s and 60s. Kids weren't home playing Xbox and watching videos all day long on YouTube. They were out playing with their friends and playing baseball and having Sandlot games. And it was just a different life altogether. So, yeah, the Sandlot's one of my favorite. In that movie, I love the scene where they try chewing tobacco and they go on the ride at the uh, carnival, and all of them start throwing up like all over everybody <laughs> on the carnival ride. That absolutely kills me every time I've seen that. I mean, they, they got the chew on, and they're chewing, and they're all happy. And then you see as the ride's going on, they're all like, oh, God. And anyone that's chewed tobacco knows if you swallow two chewing tobacco juice, it is not going to work out good for you in the end. So uh, great movie. So uh, remember the Titans? I, you know, I was thinking about that one. I don't have it on my list because I think that's a well-known movie, at least in my book, and uh, it got a lot of press. It was a great movie. Denzel Washington was amazing as the coach, and uh, I guess I didn't consider that to be underrated, but definitely one of the best sports movies, very motivational movie about bringing you know white and African-American people together, and I think we need some of that in today's society. So I think that movie packed a lot of punch with the uh, the meaning behind it.
it was also a very good sports movie. So Teen Wolf, you know, I, I love Michael J. Fox. I just watched the other day The Secret of My Success, the old 80s movie with Michael J. Fox. And I'm a big Michael J. Fox fan. Anyone that grew up in the 80s, you kind of had to be. Teen Wolf, I'd have to maybe watch that again. I don't think that would make it on one of my underrated movies right now. I don't remember loving that movie. But maybe I need to go back and watch it again. So I'm going to say maybe on that one, okay? So let me get back to my list. Uh, we had the program we just talked about. Now, some of these, again, these next few also may not be completely underrated, but I don't think the either people think of these when they think of like, you know, Rocky and Rudy and some of those top sports movies. How about, how about uh, Jerry Maguire from 1996? You know, we talked about all the right moves from 1983 with Tom Cruise. Jerry Maguire, I thought was a very good uh, football movie from 1996. He was a sports agent. Every time that's on, I've got to stop and watch it. And I don't know if that's considered to be like a marquee, sports movie but jerry Maguire definitely makes my list as one of the top uh, underrated sports movies of all time now going to tom cruise again now i am not a big nascar fan all right i know a lot of people are uh days of thunder <laughs> who's seen that movie from 1990 tom, tom cruise is a nascar driver and man that is one of those movies when that movie is on i cannot flip by it phenomenal movie all adrenaline it's like the the car version of like top gun it's <laughs> just a great 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 movie and it's funny since that movie came out uh, we do have a big raceway up here in new hampshire so i've gone now to a couple of races at uh, the new england motor speedway up in Loudoun, new hampshire and you know i'm still not a, a nascar fan but if you haven't been to like a nascar race in person put it on your bucket list and you get to go to one of these things to see what it's like and experience it i mean even in new hampshire it's a relatively small track for uh, NASCAR racing, but they pack in 110,000 fans. And this is, I mean, you talk about going to an NFL football game. This is an event. You go in here, you see these guys driving 200 miles an hour across this track, crashing into walls, flying up in the air. I mean, seeing NASCAR in person is something you should do at least once in your life if you haven't done it, right? Some of these dates, right? When you look at them, you're like, Jesus, that movie is that old. It's so true. But uh, one thing you have to prepare for, though, when you go to a NASCAR race, I went to the one in New Hampshire. I think there were 110,000 fans that day, and I think there were maybe 116,000 teeth at the people in that stand. So you're not going to be getting caviar, a caviar-eating crowd when you go to a NASCAR race. I'll tell you that right now. There were some scary fucking people at that race, but I still enjoyed it. We saw a couple of good fights out in the parking lot, so all that stuff. Yeah, you know, I've got all my teeth, so I definitely brought the average up that day when I was there you know, with all the teeth that I do have. But uh, I haven't been to the dentist in over a year because we lost our dental insurance, so that could change when I go back in a couple of weeks. So anyway, if you haven't seen Days of Thunder, check it out. Great movie about NASCAR. Now, this next movie, I hope that you have all seen this. If you have not, you need to rent it immediately. You need to go on to Netflix, find it wherever it is. 2005, Russell Crowe, Cinderella Man. If you have not seen that movie, that, oh, there we go. And both of those are on my list. Cinderella Man is one of the best boxing movies I have ever seen. Million Dollar Baby also. And I've got that a few more down on my list. So I may jump ahead to that after I talk about Cinderella Man. But Russell, Russell Crowe plays James J. Braddock from the early 1900s. He's a man that uh, he ran into some bad luck. Then the Depression hit. He couldn't feed his family. His children were starving. DCF was going to take him away. And then he had his old trainer kind of came back, or his old promoter, and kind of gave him a shot to come back and fight You know, during the Depression. And you know he won the fight. And then he said, well, you know, you won that one fight. Maybe I can get you one more. And it kept kind of going that way. Until Russell, you know, until James J. Braddock kept winning the fights, winning the fights, winning the fights, and then got a chance to fight basically the Mike Tyson of that era. Uh, his name was Max Bear. So uh, amazing, amazing, amazing motivational movie. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Roast Master Glenn, John loves these shows because he gets the gas bag and not share the floor. You're right. Hey, you know, you're a sports guy. Call in. You're a sports guy. Call in and join me. Of course. I'm just going to talk over you. So, you know, you may not have much to say, but um, I'll let you call in. Certainly after I run down my list, of course, that may be two hours into the show. So uh, <laughs> Cinderella, man, great movie. Eric put it in the chat. So I'm going to kind of scroll down my list. Million Dollar Baby, great movie with Hillary Swank, a female boxer, same type of thing, you know, hard luck life, decided she wanted to become a boxer, no support from her family. And she did very well in her boxing career. And I've got to say that this movie if you haven't seen Million Dollar Baby, you know, um, it is just 
a horrible twist, like three quarters of the way through. Something happens that just absolutely breaks your heart in this movie. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but just be prepared for the twist that comes in Million Dollar Baby. And uh, it's it's hard to watch, but it's a very, very good movie. And that's definitely on my list. And that was, believe it or not, 2004. I can't believe it was that long ago. So other movies, I think I saw someone mentioning Happy Gilmore. I actually did have that on my list from 1996. Uh, Glenn, you're a Canadian, so I'm sure this is pro- would probably be on your list. I'm not sure if this is even considered to be, you know, underrated. I think it is a little bit because this was a great, great, great movie about the U.S. hockey team, Miracle, from 2004. Just an amazing movie. I mean, what they did that year, you had a team of Americans that were uh, not professionals, and they were playing professionals from all across the world, and they ended up going and uh, winning the gold medal that year in the Olympics. And it was funny. Everyone remembers the big game against the Soviet Union, but that was not the game that actually won the gold medal. I think they beat, sorry, Glenn, I think they beat Canada <laughs> in the in the gold medal game to actually win the gold that particular year. So a miracle, great, great, great hockey movie. I love the scene in that when they're skating. You've got all these guys from you know, these prestigious colleges, you know, the Boston universities, the wherever, they're skating and practicing. And he kept asking them as they were skating. I mean, they were like throwing up. He's having them do skating drills at the end of practice. What's your name? And they kept saying, you know, they kept saying their last name. And then eventually he was looking for them to say their team name. So he had these guys throwing up and you, you just saw how this guy gelled together this team. Now, again, I am old enough where I did watch the actual Olympics happen that year. And that was pretty amazing to watch that actually in full unfold in person to watch some of those heroes that year in that particular movie. Uh, okay, here you go, guys. Who likes Mark Wahlberg? Anyone, 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 anyone? Mark Wahlberg with Invincible uh, from 2006, the score of Vince Papali. He was a guy that uh, literally walked on to the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, they had a new coach that year. He came on. The Eagles were like the joke of the NFL, terrible football team. And the new coach, he came in. And yeah, Donnie's brother, Mark Wahlberg, absolutely. So um, he came in to coach the team, and he literally had, in the city of Philadelphia, open tryouts where anybody could come down and try out to try out for the Philadelphia Eagles. So I love the tryout scene where you show you, you saw these guys that you know, were probably 50 years old that hadn't played football in like 30 years. They were like a hundred pounds overweight, not in shape showing up with capes and things like that. But then you had the one guy, you had Mark Wahlberg's character of Vince Papali came down and tried out for the team. And he eventually ended up making the team and was on the team for several years as like a special team star and just like the heart of the team, almost like a Rudy Rudiker type of person. So if you haven't seen Invincible, man, great football movie, motivational football movie, and a true story also, which is kind of sweet. So check that one out as well. I got Million Dollar Baby. I already talked about that. I don't know how I feel about this one. I wrote it on the list. I don't know if it's really underrated, but I think the original Bad News Bears from 1976, great movie. Um, it's probably not too much in the forefront, forefront now, with you know younger people that maybe are into watching sports movies, but if you haven't seen the original Bad News Bears from 1976, you gotta watch the movie just for the interactions that you have. It, it shows how different society was back in the 1970s as compared to what it is today. So back you know in 1976, there was a scene where the coach Buttermaker was literally like drinking beer in the dugout. You know, <laughs> back in the day, you thought nothing of that. When I played, I had coaches that would drink beer in the dugout, so it happened pretty regularly back in the day. And uh, there was a scene also where one of the fathers of oh, a totally racist movie. You remember the one scene where the coach of the other team goes out to talk to his kid on the mound and his kid talks back to him. His father just winds up, smashes him right across the face, knocks him down on the ground. No one thought anything of it back in 1976. And honestly, that was true. Back in the day, man, if you talk back to your parents, you get a smash right across your face in front of everybody and nobody would even bat an eye. So they, they literally have that, that movie. But you're right. That movie was so racist and just so inappropriate in so many different ways, but still just a funny, good baseball movie. And hold on, there goes my phone. Let me shut that down. There we go. Get someone calling me. So anyway, Bad News Bears, 1976. Now, who out there saw The Wrestler from 2008 with Mickey Rourke? That's another one that's on my list. If you haven't seen that, again, it means it's about WWF wrestling back in the day before WWE. And Mickey Rourke plays this down-and-out wrestler, and, uh, you know, I'm not even a big Mickey Rourke fan, to be honest with you. It was one of those ones where I saw the ad for it, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to watch that. That looks stupid. But it was honestly a really good movie about a guy that just, just had a fucked up life, 
you know, he had been on drugs. He screwed up everything in his life. And the only place he was happy and the only place people respected him was when he went into the ring for WWE or WWF. And uh, he was a well-known wrestler, but he was past his time. So he kind of you know tried to re reestablish a relationship with his daughter. And unfortunately, you know, I'm not going to get into too much, but that didn't go the way he had hoped. And uh, at the end of it, you know, he's got a serious heart problem and he ends up going back into the ring to wrestle. And if you haven't seen The Wrestler, definitely watch it. Good movie. You know, put your, your fake wrestling stuff aside. Put your Mickey Rourke reservations aside. I think he was nominated for an Academy Award that year. And that was 2008. So that was also a great, great sports movie. All right, another one. Um, baseball, back to baseball. One of my favorites. I'm not sure how many people saw this movie, but it, did anyone see the baseball movie Hardball with Keanu Reeves from 2001? Um, good, good movie again. Um, you know, it was, Keanu Reeves was this uh, young guy that had like a gambling problem. He was in debt to bookies and he needed money. So uh, this guy that ran this corporate outreach program offered to pay him to coach the team for him because he didn't feel like doing it. So he was in a really rough part of, I'm not sure if it was Chicago or where it was, but right at the baseball field was in the middle of these tenement buildings where there were gangs and everything like that. And he was this white guy, you know, coaching a bunch of African-American kids who lived in the inner city. Just nasty. You've been to those projects, nasty projects. Now, where are those, Mr. A? Are those actually in Chicago? Or where are those? I mean, just a scary, scary area. And I was in an area like that last night. I was actually my, my cell case, south side of Chicago. That's what I thought. I was in the area of uh, Worcester, Mass. Last night, where my son was lifting, I went for a walk, and I was in a pretty scary area last night. So it was one of those areas where I started to, you know, wonder if I should be walking in that area. But you know, this story, the, the the story is almost like a modern day version of the Bad News Bears. But heart, you know, it 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 um it has a really sad twist in the end, but really a motivational movie about how arrogant a lot of the other teams were that were playing against this team of young kids that came from the south side of Chicago. Keanu Reeves was awesome in the in the role. And who was the woman? Was it Diane Lane? Was his uh, love interest in that? She was a teacher. And, uh, you know, Keanu Reeves ended up getting, getting himself out of debt, won like a big bet, won a lot of money, paid off his debts, and had a ton of money in his hand. And his buddy wanted him to go back out and gamble. You know, let's put some more money down in another game. At that point, he decided, you know what? I'm really getting something out of coaching these kids. I don't want to be in a hole gambling anymore. So instead of going out and gambling his money away, he ended up taking all the kids to like a major league baseball game, their first game to go see the Cubs play. And, uh, you know, they got to see back in the day, Sammy Sosa. It was just a great, great movie. So if you haven't seen Hardball with Keanu Reeves from 2001, I definitely recommend it. Excellent, excellent movie. All right, moving forward, I'm getting to the end of my big list. And uh, I got a few more good ones on here. One actually, one or two I actually haven't really seen, but they were on another list that I looked at. But the next one on the list, I don't know if you consider this to be underrated, but I'm not sure everybody saw this. I saw it, and I found this to be a very, very, very powerful film. 42, the story of Jackie Robinson. Some would say maybe this wasn't underrated. This was 2013. If you haven't seen this movie, it's one that you have to see. I mean, I don't think I realized what Jackie Robinson was against, was up against during his career. And you got to see also about what a visionary Branch Rickey was back in 1946 when he decided to, you know, bring in the first African-American player into the major leagues. And uh, the gentleman that played, oh, his name's escaping me. The gentleman that played Jackie Robinson in that movie, he was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing in that film. And that there was one scene I remember that was just brutal. There was a, a coach from the other team was an absolute racist. Jackie Robinson was at the plate. And uh, yes, I can't, th what's his name? I can't think of his name, the black Panther guy, but anyway, uh, Jackie Robinson's at the plate and this guy, Rex Chapman, who was a real coach in the major leagues and a player. You can look him up was standing on the edge of the dugout, right on the top of the steps and yelling to him over and over again. And then, and then, and then, you know, the N word over and over and over again. And, you know, Jackie Robinson held it together. Yeah. Chadwick Bozeman. That's it. Thank you. So Jackie Robinson held it together while he was at the plate. And they show a scene where he goes into the runway. He, you know, he, he made it out. He goes out of, through the dugout into the runway back towards the clubhouse and he just you know, takes his wood bat, smashes it in, into pieces on the wall. He's like down on his knees, like crying, you know, about what, what was going on in the game. 
And Brant's Ricky, you know, played by Harrison Ford, came down to talk to him. And, you know, he, huh, it was just a powerful, powerful, powerful scene where Jackie Robinson's yelling at uh, Branch Ricky, you know, do you know what this is like? Do you know what this feels like? And Branch Ricky just looks at him and goes, no, but you do. You do, and that's why you're here. And uh, it was it was just an amazing, amazing scene. And I'll tell you, if you, if you haven't seen 42, you got to see it. Great, great, great movie. And it really shed some light on you, on on the whole Jackie Robinson thing and what he had to put up with when he was you know brought into the major leagues. So great movie. All right, uh, moving on. The Blind Side. Who has seen that? I'm sure a lot of people have. I think that was another Disney movie. Uh, the story of Michael Orr. Now, I'm I'm kind of impartial to this one because I was a lineman, so I love stories about linemen because everyone knows that linemen are the best athletes on the field, and without linemen, you don't have a good football team. Of course, that's coming from a lineman. But this was the true life story about Michael Orr, who eventually ended up making it to the NFL. He was homeless. Uh, he had nothing. He didn't have a family. So this family brought him in, kind of helped him get his uh, get his grades up, and eventually, uh, in the beginning, even though he was a huge guy, wasn't a very good football player, they finally coached him up, and he became an excellent football player, played in college at Old Miss, and then went on to star with the Baltimore Ravens for many years in the NFL. Uh, just a great movie. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a feel-good movie. It's got some comedy in it. It's got some drama. And, you know, when you, when you just see – you know, what went into making this guy like a, eventually an NFL star. I mean, the whole story is just improbable and amazing. So if you haven't seen uh, The Blind Side, Sandra Bullock's in it, uh, you know, good movie. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And again, it was based on a true story. All right, now, Glenn, I'm going back a little bit. I'm sure you know this one, uh, even though you're maybe a tad bit younger than me. How about from 1977? Does anyone know the Hanson brothers? If you don't know what I'm saying when I say the Hanson brothers, then you need to Watch this hockey movie immediately. Thank you, Doss. I knew somebody would lay that down. The movie Slapshot with Paul Newman is one of the, I mean, probably probably my favorite hockey movie of all time. I mean, I do like Miracle, and I admittedly say hockey is not my number one sport. It's probably my number four of the major sports. But um, Slapshot, man, funny movie, and you got these three brothers. I mean, this was back in the day in the in the NHL when it was all about goons. I mean, you, there was fighting like you had never seen back in the day. When I was a kid, the Boston Bruins, literally the entire team went into the stands in a game and they were fighting the fans. I mean, every game you had fights, you had blood on the ice. It was literally like wrestling compared to what it is today. They've tamed, you know, hockey quite a bit over the years, but oh yeah, the good old days, hockey was amazing back then. I used to love one of my favorite players for the Bruins was Stan Jonathan. I mean, oh, he he was a little small, tough guy, but just would beat the shit out of everybody. Uh, Terry O'Reilly, some of my favorites from way back in the day with the Bruins. But the, the but the movie Slapshot had these three brothers. They wore big, thick glasses, and they didn't look like hockey players at all. They were on the end of the bench. And finally, the coach said, all right, you three, get in the game. One game, gave them a chance. These three go onto the ice, and I swear to God, I'm surprised that they didn't like kill half the members of the other team. They went out and they were just animals, just vicious, long hair, Coke bottle style glasses, and they were destroying everybody on the other team. And one of the funny lines is they're in the game, just beating the shit out of the other team. And one of the guys on the bench goes, Jesus Christ, who the fuck are these guys? It was amazing. But they, there was one scene where before the game even started, they got into a huge fight before the game, bench clearing brawl, both hockey teams, and they show the three Hanson brothers standing side by side, blood all over their faces. One's got like a cracked lens in his glasses. And the referee comes up to him and goes, listen, you know, the national anthem is playing. He's like, listen, you guys need to keep it in order. I'm not putting up with any of your shit. He's kind of like scaring him before the game. The Hanson brothers looks at him and goes, shut up. I'm listening to the fucking song. <laughs> just screams it out loud. And the referee just stops. So if you haven't seen Slapshot, classic, classic, classic movie. And I would say since it was 1977, probably a bit of an underrated movie today. Now, this movie, I haven't seen this movie, so I can't say I saw this on a list. I've heard people talk about it. So maybe some of the people in here might be able to help me out. From 1971, Brian's Song. I've never seen the movie, but it was ranked on a bunch of different lists that I looked at, and I've never seen it. I'm not sure if anybody's seen that movie uh, in the chat here, but apparently Brian's Song is an excellent, excellent movie and considered to be very underrated on a lot of people's lists, all right? Uh, here's a Rob Lowe movie, another hockey movie that made by list, Young Blood from 1986. I did see that movie, and just that, you know, Rob Lowe was kind of like a, 
you know, one of the one, more of a scorer, wasn't really a fighter and he had a lot of talent, but as he moved up the ranks, you know, he had guys that would target him and beat the shit out of him and stuff like that. But young blood, I remember from 1986 was also a very good movie. Now, the last one I've got on my list and I've already been talking for 44 minutes. So bear with me. Um, North Dallas 40 from 1979. I'm not sure if anybody's seen that, but it's like a movie about the Dallas Cowboys, professional football, you know, the players all having to take pain pills and drugs. And it just shows how cutthroat, you know, playing in the NFL was back in that day. And I'm sure it is still today. But uh, if you haven't seen North Dallas 40, that is another classic sports movie. So, man, I've run through a lot now. Did I miss anything, guys? Can you think of any movies that uh, are not on my list that maybe I've kind of forgotten about? I did see Blue Chips a little bit earlier, which was a good ad. I definitely missed that one. Eric had reeled off quite a few movies as well. But uh, it's funny how this show happened today. I, I ended up watching one movie for the love of the game and started thinking about, you know, how the hell did I miss this movie as being a great sports movie? And it made me start thinking about some of the others out there that I think over the years maybe, you know, people haven't seen. So I'm going to run through this list one more time very quickly. I'm not going to give descriptions. And if any of you haven't seen some of these sports movies and you're big sports fans, I would highly recommend that you take a look. All right. So from the top of my list going down, Rookie of the Year. You know, I see that in there. That, that, that was a good movie. I did like Rookie of the Year. I've seen that a few times. Baseball movie. Very good movie. I did like that. So that's a, that's a good one to have on the list as well. Uh... <laughs> oh, Glenn. Glenn, you're killing me, man. You know I love you in there in the chat. All right. So very quickly, here goes the list. All the Right Moves with Tom Cruise from 1983. Great football movie. Fever Pitch from 2005. 61, the baseball movie from 2001, Moneyball from 2011, Seabiscuit, about horse racing, but it was good, trust me, 2003, Tin Cup with Kevin Costner in 1996, A League of Their Own, baseball movie from 1992, We Are Marshall, about the tragic story of the plane crash that took the Marshall football team in 2006. For the love of the game, Kevin Costner, 1999, you add that along to Field of Dreams and Bull Durham, and that's the baseball trifecta. The Program from 1993 with James Kahn, Jerry Maguire from 1996, of course, Tom Cruise again. And to follow that one up, Days of Thunder with Tom Cruise again from 1990. That's the one movie that gets me a little bit interested in NASCAR when I've tried and it just doesn't do it for me, but that movie does it. It's the NASCAR version of Top Gun. Cinderella Man from 2005, great boxing movie with Russell Crowe, Happy Gilmore. Don't know if that's underrated, but great movie, funny movie from 1996. Miracle, amazing hockey movie from uh, 2004. Invincible, uh, the story of Vince Papali and the Philadelphia Eagles, 2006. Million Dollar Baby, boxing movie with Hilary Swank. Tragic, tragic, tragic turn. Three quarters of the way through. Painful to watch. But 2004, great movie. Uh, Bad News Bears, 1976, the original. Just to see how inappropriate life was back then when you have a beer-drinking coach and another coach that beats the shit out of his kid uh, on the mound in front of everybody, and you will deal with some racism in this movie, so just beware of that if you go in watching that. Uh, the Wrestler, uh, 2008, with uh, Mickey Rourke. Hardball with Keanu Reeves, 2001. The movie, 42, with Chadwick Boseman uh, from 2013. The Blind Side from 2009. Slapshot from 1977. Brian Song, which I now have to watch, from 1971. Youngblood from 1986. And North Dallas, 40. From 1979. So, Eric, are you still here? Or did you abandon me? I probably bored the hell out of you with my sports talk. But, uh, Eric, uh, Glenn, anybody else, if you guys want to call in, I've got probably about 10 minutes left before I wrap up the show. We got Eric coming in. Let's see. And we got him connected. Let me make sure I have all the buttons turned on so you can actually speak. Are you with me, Eric? I'm here still. Oh, I did it. The boomer on his Roadcaster Pro actually getting the buttons right for once. So I'm proud of myself. That's a, a, a plus for me to be able to do that. Well, um, <laughs> I just got a, another package today in the mail from, from Old Man. And, and I definitely say to the Old Man, thank you. And I'm going to te text you a picture of, the, of what I got today. Oh, nice. I'd love, to see that. I'd love to see that. So that was nice that the Old Man sent you, sent you something. And now you, do, you know, I, I asked for your address. 
I haven't sent it yet, but I've got something coming your way in the near future also. So be ready mm -hmm. for me to send that to you, okay? Because you've been, uh, <laughs> DOS, it's a trophy. <laughs> so, Eric, now, I, I saw you reeling off some some movies. Now, I know you're not a, maybe, a, a you know, sports isn't like number one in your list, but what are some of your, maybe your top five sports movies that you've enjoyed that you've seen? Um, I think like sports movies in you know, my lifetime that I think were really memorable. I mean, I, I remember, you know, Rookie of the Year was was pretty hilarious. Um, and the I Angels in the Outfield movie with Christopher Lloyd. And, oh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Yeah, those were good. Um, the Air Bud movie from 1997. But but I think Air, Air Bud and Angels were like part of like a franchise. But but after Angels in the Outfield, um, I think everything just went like to like TV movies after that or yeah. direct to home video and DVD and stuff. What, you know, my wife always talked. What was that figure skating movie? There was a figure skating movie where the girl kept saying, Toe pick. Remember the hockey player, DB Sweeney, had to become a figure skater because he got injured? My wife loves that movie. Yeah, actually, I've watched it with her. It's not bad. That's a pretty good movie. I can't think of the name mm -hmm. of that movie, but I've always liked that one. But there are so many good sports movies out there. And, uh, you know, the nice weather today got me thinking about baseball. So I watched a baseball movie and that got me jacked up on sports movies. And now I'm all hyper today, Eric. I got to find a way to calm down. I got to go back to work is one of the things I have to do. So I got to get back to my job. But, you know, as I said earlier, man, 60 degrees this week in Boston. We're going to be getting some outdoor time. So I'm kind of excited about that. And uh, you know, I did like the movie that you mentioned um, earlier in the chat. Cool Runnings. I don't want to brush by that one. That one may have been. Yeah. That was it. Was it John Candy? Was in that? I think that John Candy was in it. I think it was like the Jamaican bobsledding team. It was. And you know, when you think of the premise of that, when you think of John Candy, the Jamaican bobsled team, when you hear that, first of all, you think John oh, Candy was also in Rookie of the Year, too. Right. Well, that was, a, but Cool Runnings was a great movie. I mean, it really was a great movie about uh, the, you know, the, the literally the, the Jamaican bobsled team. And if you think about that, how many bobsledders come out of Jamaica? It's 90 degrees every day, so not too many. But, uh, you know, they found a way to make the Olympics, and John Candy was coaching them. It was really a good movie. And that, that actually made me think of also, what was that right. movie where the guy was the ski jumper? That came out like a couple of years ago. What was it? Oh, there um, we go. I thought I just shouted from the other room. Eddie the Eagle. I don't know if anyone's seen that movie, but the guy had special needs. He was a little bit off. And he actually ended up making the Olympics as a jumper and, uh, you know, didn't obviously win a gold medal or anything, but by him just being there was absolutely amazing. So if you haven't seen Eddie the Eagle, that was another one, almost like a, a cool runnings type of movie. That was another really good sports movie that I think flies under the radar. But, uh, I don't mean, so what else is going on in your life, bud? Anything happening? Um, don't really have a whole lot going on today, but. Well, like I even said on the old man's podcast earlier, I know the weather looks really lovely today here in Georgia. I know the sun is out. Nice. Nice. And now, I, I don't know if you got in last night. I think you were in for a little while now. You remember last night, We I have to mention this very quickly. You know, there was mm -hmm. that trolling issue with Chris last night on his show. Or actually, oh, and over on Sightly Show. Um, on Sightly Show. And I didn't see what was said, but I, I actually texted with Chris last night, he was pretty upset. I'm glad he went on and did his show last night. It sounds like the and I think Jeremy happened. talked to him as well. Um, yeah. But but I think I'd also you know brought up you know uh, you know us you know you and me and Jeremy and James and, and Chris needing to follow up with the with the Podbean rep because you know Jeremy had already had talking to a Podbean rep after that February second incident at his show to find out like um, yeah. you know like confirming the identities of of these people who are, who are doing this malicious trolling and bullying. And I'm no, I'm no technology expert, but it shouldn't be hard for them to track IP addresses. I mean, you can go in and you'll know, create 10 different profiles inside of five minutes right now. And you can keep coming in under a different name, but it probably be made an effort. If someone was blocked, they could track IP addresses and then literally block someone from the platform. If they continually act like an ass, it shouldn't be that hard for them to actually monitor this. And you know, me, all they I mean, have to do is basically go in their servers and, um, you know, pull, pull up past shows, you know, not just the audio, but, but the live chat, and when they see those names pop up and stuff, they should be able to to pull up that name and 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 then pull up where the IP address is coming from. It should be that hard. They should be able to do it, but that's up to them to decide. Because but, I think um, even me and Laura had this discussion on her show last night that that I think it's going to be like a group effort of of Pod being you know friends like you and me and 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 James and even the old man and Dina Joe and others you know 
really needing to put pressure on Podbean to act because, you know, they're making so much money off of podcasters like you pay, paying monthly hosting fees or, or yearly hosting fees and, and us buying, purchasing the gold beans, which I know they take a, a massive cut off of it. And podcast hosts like you, I mean, you know, kind of get shortchanged to, to a certain extent. I get paid nothing, man. I don't get anything. But if you're smart, Glenn, you're a smart guy. But let, you know what we should do, actually, is you should have someone that could write a good email, put together an email, and have a bunch of us agree to be on the chain and just copy in a bunch of different people. I would certainly have my name on it. And this should be literally an email that goes out to Podbean, copying in like 20 different shows or whatever, and just make a statement saying, listen, this shit needs to stop. You need to do something to you know, prevent this from continue, continuing to happen. And I mean, I don't know if they'll cause them to take action or not, but at least it would show some solidarity between some different, or, shows, you know, you know, you know, you know, some of them could even be not only threatening to li- leave them and them re- risk losing money, but, right. but you, you know, you could even have some of them threatening to take legal action or, or some could be like, I have a friend who works for the FBI or I have a friend, you know, who is a congressional staffer, blah, blah, blah. And cause you don't want, you don't want, you definitely don't want the federal government lighting the fire under your ass, but I think that's probably what it needs to come down to. You know, and honestly, I mean, Podbean, they got so much, they got so much money coming in from all these different people. I think when it comes well, down the church shows are making them so much money too. Yeah, I, I don't think they give a shit when it comes down to it, honestly. I mean, I think that's, a, I, I think you need to, you need to make them give a shit because I, I mean, again, they don't care. They don't care if there are trolls coming in. I'm sure in their mind, they're like, yeah, hey, there's nothing we can do to, to stop that. It's going to happen no matter what. But I think you need to make them care. But I mean, for me, you know, trolls, you want to come into my show? Come on in. I don't care. But when you get vulnerable people, like some of the people on the platform that have special needs that are being attacked and being called retarded and things like that. And then you have Chris, who's been through some very difficult life circumstances and people are coming in and attacking him for that. That's what it bothers you know, me. If you or, are, or, or attacking people like trolls. me and James for our sexuality, of course. No, you know, since, since one of these trolls, the morality police. I know. I hear that, brother. That one bothered me to hear that they were kind of getting on you and uh, and slightly because of you know your I don't know how to say it properly your orientation, your sexual orientation, or whatever references. It is. Yeah, reference is probably a boomer way of saying it. But I mean, to me, it's just ridiculous. In the year twenty twenty one, people are still throwing that shit out there. It, uh, I don't know. But anyway, listen, I don't want to turn it dark. I just wanted to you know, mention that thing about Chris. But why don't you run off the list of shows coming up, and I get to wrap up this well. Um, work well. I think the show's coming up later today. At- at 3 p.m. Eastern time, um, you've got Frankie D's crib, and then, and you know, around like the four or five p.m. time frame, um, hopefully Robert should be going live with the Mister Clean show, and then that's followed around six or seven p.m. Eastern time by Cummings's culture, and then you've got Chuck and Billy's Not Your Cup of Tea coming up at 8 p.m. Eastern, followed at 9:30 p.m. by the Slightly Serious show, and then. And then you've got Trice Talk coming up at 11 p.m. Eastern with their Wacky Wednesday show. You used to be, you know, like the, the frivolity show since they no longer do for frivol- Friday frivolity. And and then hopefully Chris will be doing the Forgotten Tunes around 11.30 p.m. or mid- midnight like he normally does. And, and of course, Chit Chat with the Old Man tomorrow, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Eastern. And then and I know you're back tomorrow morning with, with a good interview with a with a, a YouTube star and I'm, I'm sure you're going to provide that name momentarily. Um, then the old man has his Friday night and Sunday music shows. Then you've also got lyrical accidents, tall tales of the rabbit hole, the it's a doomsday podcast also over the weekend and, and shows that are owned and impromptu times include communication station with Lara, whose podcast is this anyway with pink squirrel lady me's a day in the life of me podcast. Should she show up with a, a live show and, and you know, cra- crazy town. She's usually on in like night hours, so um, definitely be on the lookout for them and and many other good podcast friends. And I see Chris is in the in the chat. I don't know if you're still here or not. You're welcome, Chris. And just remember, and you know, we talked about it last night. Trolls that come into show under fake names all have the same problem. They all have tiny little penises, and that's the problem. They have to overcompensate for having two inches below the waist. And when these people come in and they have to, they have to troll. They're trying to make up for their lack of penis size. So don't feel bad. I know Glenn has the well, same. Well, so. I just prefer to say that they're only just coming in here to double down and triple down on stupid because that just really shows you how very stupid they are. They are stupid with small penises, as they said back in the movie. What was it? Um, oh, what was the fuck of the movie? Animal House. 
you know, small penis and stupid is no way to go through life. So that was kind of one of the abridged quotes from that movie that uh, was was pretty funny. So, all right, hey, everybody, I got I got to get my ass back to work. So everyone have a great day. Hopefully you enjoyed my yeah. rundown of underrated sports movies, and we will see mm-hmm. you all soon. Eric, thanks for calling in. Yeah, well, love you and God bless you, and look forward to seeing back on again tomorrow, John, and and seeing everybody around on Podbean. I played a different song on the way out. I'm going to go with this. I hit the wrong button, but I like this. Hey, thank you, Eric. Good idea. Maybe now.